and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the upcoming Burn 2D6, the game that will ask you to feel the burn, the one and only Captain Bo... Why did I say Captain? Kevin Bora. <laughs> I have no idea why I said Captain there. Well, thanks for having me, Mildred. Thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks for, com thanks for coming on and bearing and um, braving through time zone hell. Although a one hour difference isn't as bad as some of the other ones I've had to deal with. No, not at all. No, if you were if you were on the other side of the UK, I'd be wondering what the hell you're doing up this late. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But But I do I do go to bed early, you know, I'm an early riser. I I don't sleep. You have you have the advantage on all of us. That is debatable. But I'd like to start the these kind of things with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So sure. walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good one. I mean, it, um, you know, uh, for me, it really began long ago in the 80s uh, when I was in middle school. And, um, you know, I... Uh, I saw, you know, that red box uh, of D&D, &D, and I wondered, you know, what, what the heck was that with the, you know, kind of dragon on the cover type of thing, and um, picked it up and uh, read through the read through the book, um, you know, convinced my parents to buy it for me, and, um, uh, you know, when I was done with it, um, you know, it was uh, not like anything I had, uh, you know, uh, heard before you know this you know imagining what was going on describing what was happening to others and um, you know I quickly uh, you know was able to find a few other people there weren't many at the time around where I was who were interested as well and you know just started playing it was a group of uh, three of us to start and then uh, you know uh, over, over time we went from that you know basic and expert and all that fun stuff on to playing you know, advanced Dungeons and Dragons, or even more fun, villains and vigilantes, and uh, Elf Quest, and all these other different uh, RPGs that were a whole heck of a lot of fun. Uh, you know, so uh, that that was kind of my entree was just uh, you know as a as a school age kid learning uh, learning about what role playing games were and, uh, you know, discovering a, a great world of imagination. And I think probably what, uh, kept me in it and, uh, doing it, although I did take a long break to say I stayed in it is a bit of a lie, but I think by the mid nineties, um, I was out of it and I was probably out of it for about 20 years before I came back into the hobby. So, um, you know, so I, I'm, I'm one of these folks where I started a long time ago, took a long break and came back in the last 10 years to, uh, to, to enjoy the, the great hobby again. So, um, I got into it and then life, uh, got in the way, uh, and moving around in different places, not having a, uh, you know, consistent group around me that kind of disrupted, uh, playing RPGs for a long time. Mm -hmm. Which is understand understandable. It it definitely sounds like you were not a one system lifer even back then. Oh, definitely not. I mean, we really enjoyed uh, doing different things, whether it was uh, playing Car Wars or Traveler or, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, villains and vigilantes, Marvel superheroes, um, you know, whatever, whatever came along. Uh, we, we definitely had a, a group. Uh, where we played uh, advanced Dungeons and Dragons and played it pretty regularly, but not without breaks and, and playing different kinds of games when some would come to the table with, I'm trying to remember, I think we even, I think Elric had its own RPG back then too. And, you know, whatever people... Do you have any idea how little that narrows it down? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the... Um, uh, you know, whatever people would bring to the table and say, hey, I'd like to, why don't we play this for a little while? We'd go, yeah, let's do that. 
And, um, you know, so we, we had the opportunity to whatever people were bringing to the table, we got to, we got to play it, but, uh, you know, so it was, it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun trying different systems. So no, I've never been a, a one system, uh, kind of person, uh, too many, too many great games out there to, to try and to play and, uh, and settings too, uh, you know, especially if you have a certain system tied to a setting that you're interested in, you know, you'll dive into that setting just so that you can enjoy or dive into that system just so you can enjoy that setting. All right, I, and I can I can get that. And since you mentioned Traveler, I do have to ask this: How many times did you die during character creation? <laughs> yeah, you know I know people talk about that, but uh, I don't think I've ever died during character creation uh, in it. But it's been a long time. I haven't played Traveler in like twenty five years. Yeah. And I I joke about it, but to play Devil's Advocate for for it. Traveler's life pass system I've described as a game of chicken. At any po at any point you can say I've gotten I've got enough packages and back off. Right. Every time every time you go back in you go back in to roll out that table you are, you are still taking that risk that something bad is going to happen. There's no ca there's no cap on how many times you can take that risk. But every time you do something, ha you are taking that gamble. So, again, so again, game of chicken. How close? It's like the old that old that old visual of two two fifties cars dri driving down a cliff, and whoever hits the brakes first is the chicken. That's right. That's right. Oh. Yeah, so I mean, what, what's great is just, and even now, now is even better. Now, since I've come back into this, you know, hobby, I came and came light, lightly back in, and probably about ten years ago, and um, more strongly about five or six years ago. And um, you know, the the games today, I mean, it's it's fantastic out there, and the and and the online communities of uh, gamers is is just amazing. So if you can find a local group. Uh, to play the game you want to play, you can definitely find them online. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in with that in mind, what what can you tell me about the origin story of Burn Two D Six as a idea? Was it was it to satisfy the niche of having some sort of beer and pretzels thing for your group? You know, it, it actually started off just kind of as a thought experiment. And, uh, you know, I had, um, we, I forget what game we were playing, one of the many games, and one of the players said, you know, I really wish right now that I could sacrifice uh, this stat to, like, you know, guarantee a success or an outcome. And, um, you know, whatever the game was, we kept on playing. And I, I think it actually probably was against the Dark Master. But, um uh, we got to the end of that game and I thought about it over the weekend and I said, well, I wonder what if you had a whole, what if you had a whole game where it was all revolved around one mechanic, a sacrifice mechanic, a burn mechanic, uh, and, and could that, could you make a game that's uh, satisfying, that's quick? And so I whipped up over a weekend really quickly, just a business card game um front and back side front side rules back side character sheet and uh you know uh said oh yeah i you know you can do this and you can make something that's quick uh, you could um create a game with uh uh you know where folks could come to a table and within literally within minutes you could be playing the game and having a good time and really master the mechanics without uh, without too much even prior experience playing role-playing games. So uh, that was kind of um, uh, a happy discovery as I, I created Burn 2D6 and said, well, I, I think I've happened on a, a set of mechanics that work pretty well for a rules light kind of pickup game that could be adapted, you know, for that beer beer and pretzels type of game or you're, you're at a convention and you just have some time to kill with some people and you want to play a quick game or, you know, uh, you, um, you want to play a game, but you don't want to spend six hours or five hours playing. And you're saying, well, is there a game with a set of mechanics that really creates for 
uh, you know, a short game, a 90 minute, two hour game. And uh, so anyway, that's, that's kind of the short origin story of burn. And uh, on itch.io, I had seen some other uh, people doing things on business cards. And I said, Yeah, I, I can make it fit on a standard business card. And I looked for whatever Avery uh, um, business card number I happen to have in the house uh, lying around and uh, fed that through the printer and printed out a bunch of the cards with the with the burn 2d6 stuff on it and uh you know then then started uh before too long test playing it with uh some folks in my regular uh play group just to see you know how did it play where 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 was the potential for the system so that's the non-exciting i guess origin story of it uh you know figuring out just can you take a sacrifice mechanic and make it work in a way that is fun, exciting, and and keeps players engaged in the game. Mm -hmm. Now, as I understand it, you're using a aim low two d six. That's right. Now, was well, is the current form of it where difficulty is expressed by adding more dice? Was that was that something that you had that you had nailed down in one go, or were there a bunch of um, iterations that got that got tossed until this current form that it takes? No, so that was that was one go, and it was all right. So uh, what are we going to do about difficulty? It's two d six for a standard roll, added additional dice because that is what drives the burn mechanic. So uh, what are you burning for? For what are you burning to? And that was the decision to make. I guess the initial decision, when you burn a point of a stat, what does it do? Does it give you additional numbers? What does it do? No, it, it takes away uh, from a die that you're rolling to help improve your odds overall. And so that was really the original mechanic that was first, that I first thought of for doing for it, uh, for, for this, for burn 2d6, and it stayed the same throughout. And, uh, through play testing, a lot of play testing, it's really held up as a really strong mechanic. Uh, all right, and I, I can I can get that. And when it comes to the burn mechanic, how did that come about? Especially since that's one of the cruxes of it. I mean, you put it in the title for God's sake. That's right. I'm not hiding it. Yeah, um, it it came from this idea. If you have a stat. And this was from a player comment. Uh, could you could you sacrifice your stats uh, to improve an outcome? And I took it one step further to say, well, what if you could burn all your stats, any stats when trying to do something, and your stats were also your, I guess, indicator of health. So when you burned your stats, um, you know, that also uh, told you how you're doing. Are you alive or are you dead? And so... Um, the, the one question that came up early around burning uh, a stat was, is this a death spiral game, right? Where every time I burn from a stat, my stat decreases. And um, that was one thing uh, we play tested early on and the death spiral is terrible. And so in burn 2d6, when you burn your stat, your stat remains the same. And the next time that you roll, uh, you're still going for the same target number. Uh, you're just adding more burn to that stat. And nothing actually happens until your total burn equals your stat value. Uh, so the first bad thing that happens for burning is at that point, when you take enough burn and you add it together and it equals that total of that stat. At that point, you've now increased your difficulty for all subsequent rolls of any kind that you do by a d6 so it just and then accelerates essentially that burn for that second a stat and if you burn that second stat meaning in our parlance you burn a stat means you've mm -hmm. taken burn equal to the stat value so once you burn two stats in burn 2d6 that's it for you lights out your character is incapacitated or dead depending on uh, the setting or how you're mm -hmm. playing the game yeah, and the st the 
You have it looks like you have four stats that are the that are the all roads lead to Rome, and that is move, heart, eyes, and soul. That's right. You got it. And um, you know, in the four stats, uh, cover everything uh, you might do or contemplate in games. You know, your your move stat is everything related to movement: uh, jumping, running, driving, uh, flying, whatever that happens to be. And your uh, your heart stat is that um, uh, uh, your your a combination of your courage and and physical prowess in in fighting. Um, your ability to intimidate, your charisma, um, whereas eyes is um, your uh, your intelligence, your skill with observation, uh, and your uh, ability uh, to affect a ranged attack. Um, and then finally, soul. It's everything psychic, mystical, magical, um, all wrapped up into that stat. Anything otherworldly. Now, with with that in mind, as I as I understand it, you're shooting for having burn, um, be some be somewhat multi-genre. And with some of those with some of those genres, I'm cur I'm curious if the if um if there's going to be some rule specific some specific rules to those to those genres in the full book. Yeah, are. And so, you know, for each genre, there's a, a slight uh, modification of the rules within those genres, almost in a modular way. So you could decide that uh, some setting specific rules you're going to carry over. Um, we can take a, a real easy one in our super setting. Um, well, let's go through that burn a little bit more. So the other, other than the four stats, you also have in burn four slots that you can fill. And uh, those slots are dedicated to equipment for most of the settings. In the super setting, those slots become not dedicated to equipment, but dedicated to powers. And so you have your classic uh, superhero powers like uh, flight, invulnerability, and all of those take the place of equipment. So there's no equipment in the supers game. It's all based on uh, powers that uh, fit into those slots. So that's one modification. And they do the, the anything that fits into a slot, essentially what it does is it is a situation specific buff to a stat, whether it's a power or whether it's a, a piece of equipment. What it's really doing is impacting a skill role based on something that you want to do that involves that piece of equipment or power. So uh, again, the modification in the supers is that. In addition, in supers, um, there's a, uh, a special rule around identifying your super weakness because all superheroes must have a weakness. Mm -hmm. um, so there are rules around that as well. So when you're the first time that you burn a stat in supers, um, that's at the point where you will get your your weakness as a hero that will then apply throughout the game or the campaign to your uh, specific superpowered hero. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one way the uh, rules are modified uh, in a very simple way. Um, mm -hmm. For space opera, uh, there are rules around crew rules and, and the creation of spaceships. Um, so uh, spaceships are uh, a little, a, a little bit different. They do conform to kind of this uh, four stats um, the crew does as well with four different positions within the crew and all the rules are laid out for how to take crew positions in the ship and then how uh, players uh, crewing a crewing a ship um, how that how that really works with the burn mechanic um, but that can be uh, adapted as well so if uh, you could adapt that uh, space mechanic for operating spaceships and you could operate um, a ship maybe in the pulp era setting using those same rules. Or maybe you import that to the super setting and have um, some kind of uh, mechanism. Uh, maybe you have a giant robot and you use the crew rules in supers <laughs> to power to, uh, to run the robot. 
So although they're modular in that they're specific to a setting, you can pull them out as um, someone running a game and apply any of these kind of rule mods to, to other settings. Um, there are some specific things uh, that are a little bit different. You know, in the pulp era, you know, it's a it's a game of tough guys, tough gals, that kind of thing. And so uh, some of your opponents um, are, are pretty hardened uh, to your uh, to your attempts to intimidate them or to persuade them. And that is probably the only setting where there's a mechanic where the NPC actually has a modifier that reduces your target number. In addition to, in the core rules, you know, your your difficulty dice on any roll are modified by the difficulty of your opponent. So opponents tend to be 0d6 to 3d6 opponents in the way that we um, create NPCs. And so when you're rolling against a 0d6 opponent, there's no additional difficulty dice, mm -hmm. but a 3d6 opponent would add 3. And in addition, in the Pulp Era, not only might they be a 3d6 opponent, but they actually might have uh, a modification to your um, to your um, uh, to your stats, so that if your target number was a ten, maybe that is a really tough opponent, and your target number is an eight. So, mm -hmm. so, uh, so var various modifications to really make it um, fit each one of the yeah. settings. Uh, you know, in the myth and magic setting. Uh, you know, like any myth and magic setting, you know, I've got to have a whole set of rules around magic and how magic operates within that setting. So that's that's a that's a few pages in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But all based around that core mechanic, that burn mechanic doesn't change throughout um, and the use of those slots for for uh, equipment or uh, essentially um, uh, buffs to a stat bonuses to stats. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in, with that in mind, when it comes to as I now as I understand it, even though the base rules can fit on a, can fit on a few can fit on a postcard, and in fact the in fact that's the version that's available on itch. The full book that you are that you kickstarted recently, and congratulations on managing to get um, three point seven thousand when you were only asking for fifteen hundred. Yeah, thanks. Uh, with the full rule set, as I understand it, you are put you are expanding the rules a little bit. That's right. That's right. For each one of the sections, rules are expanded slightly. Um, you know, the same core mechanic is there. It's still four stats. It's still uh, four um, slots for each character. But yeah, uh, they are expanded. And the, you know, as an example, in the um, on itch.io, uh, you can pull down the rules right now for, for free. You can play the real slimmed down version of it or the original version. But as an example, uh, things like the the helper mechanic. How does helping another player work? It's not explained in there. Well, in the full book, the rules around helping and being helped are in there. Uh, the rules around uh, having a sidekick are in there. Um, so a, a lot of that is more fully explained. The, the rules around space travel are in there. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the kinds of expansions that are, are in the rules. Yeah. Now, with with that in with that in mind, one of the ones that's that's mentioned on the Kickstarter page that I wanted to delve a little bit into, especially since this is one that can have a few traps, is investigations. Um, right. Since you since you mentioned that two d six is the all roads lead to Rome, how does how does investigations modify it? Well, if we were in, you know, the uh, the pulp era setting, and uh, you were uh, you were a private eye, uh, and someone who, you know, invested in your essentially your eye stat, 
uh, and we're uh, looking into uh, to um, collect evidence, a combination of your equipment and your stat helps to improve that, as well as, again, this issue around your opponent. Who are you going up against um, in trying to figure something out? Those NPC-specific stats will modify the difficulty of, of what you're doing. That's essentially what it comes down to. So NPCs in Burn 2D6 have a, a couple of, a, mainly they all have a couple of stats. They have a burn max, which is essentially the number of burn that they can take before they're out of the game. Mm-hmm. And that uh, action difficulty number, which is a zero to a 3D6 number, which adds mm-hmm. to your role. The In the pulp era where investigations is really um, more prominent, Each one of your opponents will have a modified, essentially heart and in in, and uh, eyes, a stat, uh, or uh, that impacts your stat. So it could be a one, a two, or a three. And again, that influences your target number when you're working against them to try to find something out, persuade them, convince them, whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. And the main reason that I ask that kind of thing is it can be very easy for especially with how people see um, dice rolls as a pass-fail thing, that investigations can get stonewalled because of that. Hell, that's part of the reason why Kenneth Height made Gumshoe. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's nothing worse than in any game uh, hiding uh, the information that PCs need to succeed or to complete an adventure behind a wall that they can't get past, right? That is uh, that is uh, pretty bad. In uh, Burn 2D6, um, with these investigation rules, uh, you as a player could still face that uh, stonewalling piece. As an example, I could very much hide a critical piece of information that you can't get to if you fail to embrace the burn mechanic within the game. Um, You can overcome, really, any challenge within burn 2d6, and you've got to make calculation on this. You only have so much burn to use Mm -hmm. by burning past it. So if there is something you really want to accomplish in burn 2d6, you can do it. You're going to pay a price for it, but you can do it. So this idea that there will be a piece of information that you will be unable to get really you know that maybe the 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 gm is going to hide the mod is going to hide from you in some way and through bad rolling you're never going to get to that really doesn't exist in burn 2d6 because Mm -hmm. of the way the core mechanic works yeah now do you have some equivalent to criticals or botches with burn 2d6 or is it just straight numbers yeah it's pretty much straight numbers there's one modification because you are paying uh, so much. Uh, and when you get down to, we, we, we talked about it at length at one point, because I did not originally have any critical hits or anything like that, critical hits or critical failures. And we've had long discussions about it with the group that worked with me on developing it, because we had a lot of uh, very intense arguments about that. Hey, you should have a, a critical hit mechanic or you and i would say we already do we have a critical hit mechanic it's your burn mechanic if you really want to hit it and you want to be successful burn you can create your own critical hit right Mm -hmm. um with a critical failure um if you fail uh and uh what are we going to do if you roll uh really low which is which is good and you still fail are we going to make it a critical failure if you roll if you roll really high, uh, can't, we know what, how are we going to do a critical failure when, you know, frankly, depending on what your stats are, uh, you could roll double sixes on a 2d6, get a 12, and depending on your bonuses in your stats, still succeed. Mm-hmm. So 
it really didn't work out. There were some passionate folks really arguing to do it. So here's what we have instead. We have uh, something called the surge mechanic in the game. Okay, everyone begins the game with one surge. Surge works like taking a burn. Like if you want to use your surge, you can reduce the difficulty by one die. You can also use that surge to absorb any, let's say, burn damage that you can receive. You can also use that surge to insert a story element into the game. Mm -hmm. So let's say that uh, the classic example is, you know, you're in the pulp era setting and you need to get into a car quickly and get away. You see a car on the street, you go to it. There are no keys there. Use your surge mechanic. Oh, yeah, look, the keys are right here, uh, you know, on, on the dash. All right. Now you have the keys and you can get and go. You've used your surge. Mm -hmm. So any time in Burn 2D6 when you're rolling dice and all the dice that you're rolling turn face up sixes, you mm -hmm. get your surge, you get your surge back. So if you um, if you burn enough where your roll is a simple 1d6 roll, mm -hmm. you have a 1 in 6 chance of getting your surge back. You roll that 6, and you've gotten your surge back. So it gives you that little extra bump. So that's kind of a, um, uh, a, a reward for rolling badly, which is a 6. Many times, of course, you'll succeed with that 6 roll. But anytime there are double 6s, triple 6s, quadruple sixes you're going to get that you're going to get that surge back but that's the closest we come to some kind of reward or failure mechanic uh if you if you succeed you succeed if you fail the roll you fail um with any of the penalties associated with that the only time it's different is if you if you tie your target number your roll under number it's a partial success so there is a partial success mechanic. It works like other games, which is um, you succeed, but it's that, you know, get rid, as you, you've you said to me once, get that cushion ready because here comes that but, right? Something, mm -hmm. something's going on. So, um, uh, you know, and whether it's the classic, uh, yeah, you are able to get into the spacesuit uh, before the, um uh, before the ship uh, de de uh, decompresses or uh, you know uh, uh, blows its air out into space, but you only have five minutes left in in the air in the suit, those kinds of things. So you know, fully engage the partial uh, success mechanic to add a little tension, ratchet up the tension on whatever the scene is. Mm -hmm. And with now with that in mind. Um, oh, one, the one that I was interested in the most, especially was, um, hand was handling su was handling supers because before we went live, I talked about having a love hate relationship with race as class. I have an equal love hate relationship with um supers games. There's plenty of superhero games that I like, but. Supers games are something that I have to that I have to that I have to take a certain approach with, and a lot of it has to go comes down to powers. Uh huh. Because you look at a lot, even the superhero games I like, you look at them and they have a lot of powers, and your and your only guide is here's a here's a few hundred points. Go spend go spend them how you like. Now swim, damn it. <laughs> okay, that's an exaggeration, but I think you get my point. Yeah, and you know, Burn 2D6, the, the idea around the super setting is it's fun, it's light, it's outrageous, and um when you when you start in the um in the in the uh supers uh setting, you get uh you've got your four slots. Uh, that you can fill. Uh, you essentially have, like, those games, not 100 points, but you have eight bonus points to spread um, amongst those powers. And uh, so some folks uh, only end up with two powers or three powers because they they want a higher bonus level on them to start the game. Uh, but it operates a lot like other super games. Pick your powers, design your kind of hero, pick a secret identity based on the, the types that are available in Burn 2D6, and then you're off and you're ready to go. It's a it's a pretty quick uh, creation for for those supers and um, 
and then you have those powers that uh, that you put down. So I don't I don't know. I I I'm, I think you. It, it depends um, if if you're interested in having a, a fun. Uh, outrageous, non-serious game. Burn 2d6 provides a very nice environment for a supers game. If beer, you're and looking, beer and pretzels. Beer and pretzels. But if you're interested in hard, gritty, uh, watchmen, I don't know. Uh, Godlike is over of, there if that's what you want. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that, that kind of super game, that's not what Burn 2d6 is, right? Um, you're going to have a hard time in Burn 2d6, one, creating... Uh, Dr. Manhattan it, 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 with the power levels we have, it's not, it's not really possible. Right. Um, you know, these are, these are, I like to think of burn 2d6 supers, you know, they're your, they're your B heroes, right? The, the A heroes are all out fighting the space monsters and off world, the classic thing. And, uh, you know, you guys are the, you guys are the bread and butter heroes. You're the ones uh, pulling the cats out of the trees you're the ones trying to solve the um, the super villains who just uh, stole the the super laser out of the science lab. Uh, you, you're the heroes trying to deal with that uh, that uh, that giant uh, gecko that's on the side of the skyscraper. You know, um, so that's the kind of supers you are. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, why does Booster Gold immediately come to mind? <laughs> Uh, Although there is, admittedly, there is one game concept that didn't didn't um, live up to its potential, but I've dipped into it when it comes to giving a beer and pretzels pitch. There was a there was a teaser for a little game called Overstrike, which the idea with it is that it is that you're dealing with James Bond style James Bond style missions, except your except your squad are the misfits. The out the outcasts, the guys who are good at their job, but they have some personality issues. Oh, uh, if it's it so if, sounds good. And if I had to use something in a similar vein, um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with Battlefield, but um, Battlefield not Bad really, Company. No. no, not really. Where, <laughs> where um. You, where the cast that you're dealing with are essentially the losers. <laughs> like, they're the guys who get sent in because the because the because the frontline guys are too expensive. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. You know the mm -hmm. guys that no nobody expects them to do to do anything because they're all a bunch of idiots. And and I think uh, Burn Two D Six is less your idiots, but you are the. You are the hometown heroes, mm -hmm. right? You're, uh, you know, you're uh, whatever your your local mid-sized city is. You're the heroes of that local mid-sized city in a place where supers exist and are in abundance. So, um, you know, th th that's what you are. So it makes for, I, I would say that we've had a really good time playtesting supers. Uh, probably the feedback from some of my play testers was they, they just had such a ball uh, uh, playing in, in that session. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's a fun one. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's certainly a favorite of mine to run. Um, it's uh, been fun for folks to play, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Pulp Era also, I, 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 I said, I, that's one of my favorite. I also love playing running Pulp Era. Pulp Era is a lot of fun too. Yeah, and I, I can there there's there's some connective tissue, especially with pulp superheroes like say the Shadow or the Phantom. Right. Uh, which Yeah, and you can even you can even play that. I mean what's interesting about it if you know uh, those are kind of more low key heroes, but one of those could be played in the pulp era. Again, in a in a mod could say, Hey yeah, and I'll even let you pull some of those powers in uh, from the super setting to be able to do that. Um, it's easy to mix a match like that mm -hmm. uh, within it. Um, so that's one of the things I like about it, uh, about the system, the way it's grown, is that um, even within the different settings that have these setting-specific rule modifications, 
uh, you do not break the game by pulling them out uh, of those settings if you say don't want to play with that or or by putting them into another setting. Uh, none of those modifications that a mod might make as they kind of craft how they want to play it would would break anything. So because it's all because it's integrated around that one mechanic, it's it's literally impossible to break. Yeah. And with that now with that in mind, as I understand it, the core book is going to be about sixty four pages, not gonna not gonna be a a very beefy boy. It um, might be once we as we start as we add to it and we add more art to it and maps and stuff like that, it's probably gonna be more like eighty pages at this point. But yeah, I would be uh, shocked if you get over a hundred. Oh yeah, I, I better not because that'll kill my budget. But yeah, probably around eighty. Well, it's, it well it'll probably get it'll probably be a good going over a hundred would probably be a good way to get the printers to start screaming at you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes screaming at you in, in in incomprehensible accents, depending on where they're printing. Yeah, this is what we call a break-even project. So <laughs> yeah, that, you know you got to really watch those page counts. Yep. But at least for the PDF version, what are you shooting for as far as the release window? Oh yeah, so the the PDF actually, so for for folks who backed it, uh, the PDF uh, a simple text version of the PDF. So no art, uh, 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 no formatting, none of that. Just the simple text of the complete rules is going to be released no later than March nineteenth. Uh, so backers will have it available through their drive through RPG accounts. Um, I'll be sending out backer surveys this weekend uh, to make sure I get those associated uh, email accounts. And uh, that's where folks will find it. And um, it will only be available to backers uh, when it comes out. It will not be available to other folks. Um, but backers will have an opportunity not only to kind of review it, but to provide feedback and feedback will be available two ways, one through a Google form, and also they can join a Discord uh, uh, that will be set up specifically for uh, Burn2D6 and feedback about uh, the uh, rules. And we'll have about a, how can I call it, a last minute, two or three week window where if people have feedback around the rules, they can provide it during that two to three week window. And then... Uh, that window is going to close out as um, all that text goes and uh, starts being going to layout. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a while for a layout and putting all the art in and all that so we can get the book into a printable version uh, by June. So uh, there will be a brief window where there, I will have the ability to accept feedback on that. But all that's right. coming up. All right, and I'll be looking forward to seeing how Burn 2D6 develops, especially since, due to it being under a Creative Commons license, as I understand it, that's correct. Um, it's inevitable that somebody's going to come up with some create with some crazy, stupid hackery. That'll be awesome fun to see. Uh, you know, looking forward to that. Um, yeah, it will be released under the Creative Commons license, share and share alike. So. Um, you know, folks can uh, take it and uh, modify it and uh, make their own stuff with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving time zone hell to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness. Well, I appreciate the uh, the invite and the uh, ability and time to talk about myself. <laughs> My favorite topic is great. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>